Hey everybody, Jim the Tabletop Engineer here and welcome to a new episode. This is going to be another one of my paint and ramble uh, series. I'm going to be painting this guy up. Uh, this is Drax. I think that's right. Drax the Bounty Hunter. Uh, this miniature is metal. I've already primed him and glued him up. And uh, it's from Die Hard Miniatures. This is another one of those sci-fi miniatures that I really enjoy using. So uh, I'm going to point the camera down to the desktop. And in this episode, I want to talk about uh, a new game, you've heard me talk about it before, called Old School Essentials. I'm going to talk to you about what it is about the game that appeals to me. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the game, the actual game itself. And um, hopefully by the end of it, uh, if you're not familiar with Old School Essentials, I'll be able to give you enough information that you, uh, you might want to try it out. So, uh, yeah, I, I do realize I'm painting a sci-fi miniature and talking about a fantasy role-playing game. That's okay. We'll do it anyway. All right, let's get to the tabletop. All right, welcome to my table here. I'm going to start painting on this guy, Drax, right here. Got a laser gun. He's sort of, uh, I wouldn't, well, he might be reptile. He's got very large eyes. I don't know if you can see that one eye right there. Uh, he's got some scales. He's not wearing shoes. He's got claws for feet. Uh, on the Die Hard Miniature website, uh, they show him painted green. And that's a great color, but I always try to do something a little different. So I'm going to go with this vermilion, which is sort of an orangish red. I don't know. I just like the color. And I think an alien doesn't necessarily have to be green if it's lizardy or, you know, reptilian. So I'm going to start painting him uh, the color. And what I wanted to talk to you guys about today is a, and it's not new, it's been out for a couple years. It's called Old School Essentials. It's a, um, as I understand it, and I don't know the complete history of it, but it's a, it's a spinoff game that used to be called, I think it used to be called BX Essentials. I could be wrong on that. For those of you who don't know, BX stands for Basic Expert. And what it is, BX clones are games that traditionally um, are sort of, well, they're clones of the Basic and the Expert um, D&D sets put out by TSR way back when. I remember playing it. I've been playing D&D since uh, the Holmes box. And if these names don't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. It's just it's just a very early version of d and It came out about the same time as the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons uh, books came out. The DM's Guide, the Player's Handbook, and the Monster Manual. This one, uh, the interesting story that I always tell people about the Holmes box was I was in sixth grade, and my parents had asked me what I wanted for Christmas, if I was anything specific I wanted. And I'd been hearing rumors about Dungeons and Dragons, but not really. I, I'd heard of it, but I had been in the toy store, the game store, and I had seen a game called uh, Dungeon. It was a board game, and the basic premise is you you move around your heroes, and you you fight monsters, and you collect treasure, and the winner is the one who reaches a certain treasure value, uh, and the game ends. And so again, this was the board game. I had seen it played. I'd never played it, but I asked them for that. I wanted that game. Well, my parents, you know, <laughs> being parents, uh, and I'm sure I've done the same thing to my kiddos, uh, they didn't write it down. And so when it came time for them to go get the game I asked for, they ended up getting the Dungeons & Dragons basic set, the Holmes box. It has a dragon on the front. It's sort of a bluish, purplish cover. There's a dragon on the front with a wizard and a fighter uh, seen from behind. They're, they're looking at the dragon sitting on his gold hoard, his hoard of gold coins and jewels and stuff. And, um, you know, when I opened it that Christmas morning, I wasn't disappointed. I was like, oh, this is that game I heard about. I, I think I was just so excited to get something new. And I was getting into games at the time. And so I really, I didn't get upset. I know I didn't get upset about it. So I opened it up, and I'm pretty confident that that day I went and found a corner somewhere, a chair, and I sat down and I started reading it. And I was really taken with it. I didn't understand a lot of it. Now, granted, keep in mind, I was in sixth grade. This was pre-internet, 
pre-mobile phones. I mean, there wasn't a lot of places to go for questions that you had. And role-playing games were fairly new. I mean, they were new to me. I had no, I really wasn't familiar with them. So I didn't really have any place to go ask questions. But as, as it would turn out, there was a gaming club or group in Pensacola, Florida, which is where I grew up. Um, they met, I don't know if it was weekly, I think it was weekly, at the Sears uh, Shopping Center in Pensacola. They were up on the second floor in this in this room. It turns out the room was like a stock room or an employee room, but they had tables and chairs, and they they let the gamers come and play their games there. So my friends and I had been hearing about Dungeons and & Dragons, and here I was, I, I had the game. So we convinced our parents to let us go, and, and uh, we, we found out when they met and time. I don't remember how we got this information, but we did. We went, and I can't remember if my parents drove me or my friend's parents drove me, but we got there. And we walked in, and we wanted, we said, they, they welcomed us, and they said, what, you know, what can you do, we do for you? And I said, well, I, we're here to play D&D. And they did not have any slots. The, this room was small. There weren't a lot of chairs. There were, I think there were like three tables, maybe four. Memory's a little bit fuzzy. And they did not have enough space. The, 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 I think there were two guys running D&D, and they had a full table. I, I mean, probably six or eight players. And they were just like, sorry, we just, we can't, we just really can't do it. But there was another guy nearby who was running a game called Metamorphosis Alpha. It was a science fiction role-playing game by James Ward. Didn't know this at the time. And he said, come on over, you know, you, you can play at our game, and you can learn a little bit about RPGs, and, and maybe you can play D&D at a later time. So we did. We went over, and we um, we started playing, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I think we returned a few times to play Metamorphosis Alpha, but at some point, we got a chance to play D&D, Dungeons and & Dragons. And we weren't playing advanced Dungeons & Dragons. At this point in time, I don't recall if the books were out yet. I don't think they were. Well, maybe they were. It was just they weren't. It, they weren't widely available, or they, it wasn't widely being played yet. So we were playing the the basic set, which is what I owned and had. And this is a game that a lot of D and D players today they'd recognize it, but some parts, not all parts. For instance, there were no wizards. There was magic user, and there wasn't a rogue. It was just thief. Fighter was fighter, and cleric was cleric, and uh, you didn't have bards, and you didn't have rangers, and you didn't have all these other classes. Um, you also had, uh, if I remember right, and I'm, I, I think I am, dwarves and elves and half-orcs, and those were played, and halflings, those were played not as a class and a race, but like if you chose elf, you were an elf. You weren't a fighter or a magic user or, or a thief. You were an elf. And same with dwarf and I think halfling. And the basic set was really mainly involved in dungeon delving. Just going down, diving into the dungeons, and bringing up treasure, fighting monsters, avoiding monsters. Really, it, was, it turns out, and, and I found this out very early on, a lot of early D&D was running away. Um, you know, you, you would have to make a decision whether or not you were going to fight those monsters. And, and a lot of times the monsters were not balanced like they are today. You might enter, a, you might be all first level or second level characters. You might enter a room and there is a dragon. And uh, back then, you know, you if you wanted to fight the dragon, you could, but you weren't really going to probably make it out of there. And the game was just, it was played so much differently than it is today. It was um, much riskier. It was, um, it was, uh, you died. Characters died a lot. I, I know, I don't really have a lot of fond memories of my early characters because I rarely, I think, I think the highest I ever got a character up was maybe level three. I may have had a level four. I don't, I, I, it, it, memory is just failing, but I did not have 10th and 11th level characters. I mean, it just, you could, and there were players, I remember there were players that were really high and up there and we we would hide behind them and follow their lead and they they sort of knew what they were doing and um, 
but it but it was the danger of the game that really was it was very appealing. I mean, you you felt always on edge. Like when you were down there, you you had to worry about your torches burning out. The the dungeon master was keeping track of you know how much how many torches you brought into the dungeon and and then he would also or she I, I, back then I don't remember any female dungeon masters but so I apologize if I use the he gen, uh, gendered uh, uh, a lot but back then he would track things like that like you know when you lit that torch and how long it was expected to stay on and if you ran out of torches you were you were in bad shape because back then almost all characters none of them had dark vision or I think some maybe had infravision, but even that wasn't really helpful for combat. It was an interesting time to play D&D because um, you tracked everything. You tracked food. You tracked water. There was a there was an inventory type management to to the game, and I and that may not appeal to some of you. Some of you may be hearing that and going, "Oh, that sounds horrible." But believe it or not, it was very fun, and it just helped you get into it. You were going down into a deep, dark dungeon or a cave where monsters lived, and you didn't belong there. And you were not heroic. When you were level one, you were just this basic little character that you'd rolled up with three D6s, and you didn't re-roll anything. You didn't roll four D6s. You didn't have a pool of points to pull from. <laughs> what you got was what you got. And um, sometimes the DM would be cool and say, oh man, this guy's never going to survive. Go ahead and reroll. Because you might have had fours and sixes and you were just, you were not going to survive. But if you got one 16 or 15 or higher, that was, you knew that was the character you were going to play because the DM was never going to let you reroll, reroll that. You might have all the rest, fives and sixes and sevens. But if you had a 15, 16, 17, or even an 18, which was really rare, um, for a stat, you were playing that character. The DM was never going to let you reroll. So that game, that game, uh, the basic set was played for quite a while, um, and then of course, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons came out and, and added all sorts of complexities to the game. And I played Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. I have all the books. I still have my originals. I played that. Excuse me. Drop my drop my paintbrush. I played that for many many years, and then you know uh, D and D or TSR. Uh, got sold and uh, Hasbro or Wizards of the Coast bought them and then I guess Hasbro bought Wizards I can't recall the, I don't know the full history by um, by by heart but um, what happened was you know D&D &D became 2nd edition and then 3rd edition and 3.5 and then 4th edition and now we're on the 5th edition and just recently uh, Wizards announced that they're working on something to be released in 2024 which is corresponds to the um, 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons, if you assume a 1974 start date, which is when a, Gary Gygax and Arneson officially released the d, &D original d, d box set. So 50 years we're coming up on. Um, what has happened in those 50 years is the game hasn't fundamentally changed. You still have, uh, you still have stats like strength, intelligence, wisdom, you still have armor class. You still carry weapons. You still have classes, races, monsters. But the game has evolved in a lot of ways. There's, there's like, I, and I'll just speak from a 5e point of view. With, with 5th edition, um, you, you probably have, and I'm, I'm guessing here, I would estimate there's probably more than 30, maybe even more than 40 classes, official classes, that you can choose from. And... That's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that's that's what fifth edition is these days. Um, you have probably just as many races, maybe 20, maybe 30. I, I, if somebody knows an official count, feel free to add to the comments here on this video. But um, the thing is, when you compare original D&D or, or even the BX, which is what I played, basic uh, the, the basic set, which became the basic and expert, it was really a way for to introduce the game to people who had no clue how to run D&D. The basic, the BX games really were well done. Um, a lot of people call it the red box, I believe. It actually taught a DM through examples on how to become a DM. And it, it taught combat examples and, and things like that. So it was a much better, in my opinion, it was better done than the Holmes box, which is what I had to learn from. 
But what has happened recently is, um, not recently, I, I couldn't even tell you, maybe 10 years ago, maybe a little longer. Um, it, I know it was when uh, the D&D um, OS, uh, let's see, the, um, the um, game license, open game license, OGL, when it came out, uh, it allowed people to, you know, take the rules and create their own adventures and stuff. But it also allowed people to modify the uh, the game somewhat. And pretty quickly, I think people realized they could they could modify earlier versions of D and D where they didn't like certain parts of the game. They could tweak it and and make a a spinoff, a clone. And so there are. I'm making this up. There's probably dozens, there may be more than dozens of clones out there of original D&D or advanced D&D and basic expert and, and all that. Um, these have just, some of these are homebrew. People have just sort of released it and said, hey, here's the, here's the rules my game group uses when we want to play old school D&D. And then other companies have released full-blown products that you can purchase, um, either printed or maybe online, like on sites like Drive Through RPG, and you can play, you know, old school Dungeons and Dragons or very similar to it. Uh, if you want to play original old, old school D&D, original BX, you can still buy uh, on eBay and other places, you can buy that game. Pe people sell their old games all the time. Um, you could get a copy of it, and you could run it as written. The rules is written, and uh, a lot of people do that. But what a lot of people are doing these days is, and I say a lot, I don't have an exact number, but I can add me to that group. A lot of D&D &D players are starting to rediscover the fun they had playing those old school D&D uh, games. And so they've collectively called it old school, OSR, old school renaissance, old school rules, old school uh, revival, whatever you want to, the, the acronym, whatever, you, however you want to use it. It's basically just a collection of players saying, look, we want to sort of go back to the way we remember playing it. And people often will return to a game they played in their youth, even if it's out of date and it may not be the most modern or creative, they'll play it, and I'm speaking from experience here, they'll play it because it, it's nostalgic. It brings back fond memories of when they were a kid or a young adult or a college student or whatever, and they were playing these games. And again, they may not be as advanced as 5e, or they may not have all the bells and whistles that, that, that uh, modern games have, but they have something that players want. Because if they, if people weren't playing the games, uh, versions like Old School Essentials, which I'm going to be talking about, would not be in existence. They would not be thriving. And when I say thriving, I mean thriving. Um, there is, there are games out there that you you have to wait for reprints because they sell out. Uh, they're so popular, and Old School Essentials is one of those. Um, here's my guy so far. Got the brown pants. Um, so there's a lot of games out there that claim to be BX, not claim, they just, they say they are BX, B slash X clones or old school D and D games. And, um, I've, I've, I know I've played a couple here and there pickup games, but, and I definitely played some at Gen Con a few years ago, but I haven't really, um, gotten into any one, mainly because it's so hard to find consistent players. Like, you might find one player that plays this version of, of version X of, uh, of, old, of an old school D&D game, and another player that plays a different version. But there hasn't been one version, in my opinion, that really, like, jumps out and, and seems to have a following, a, a real strong fan base. Now, that... That's not entirely true. There is a free BX clone out there called Fantasy Basic Fantasy Role Playing Game. I believe that's it. I'll put a link in the video description below when I when I hunt it down. And I actually have the PDF on my iPad, and I like it. I read it, and it brings back memories because it's very much like that basic set that I played, or the BX boxes that we played. And um, 
you can get it. You can get the rules for free, and I will put a link uh, in the video description so you can go grab that and take a look at it. So, not completely true when I say there isn't any one that's really st stood out. That one, that one does. That one jumps out, and I know that there are people that play it, and I'm not quite sure. I, I think it probably has to do with a lot of times when something is free, when it's given away, um, people tend to think, oh, it's it must not be. It's a fan based product. It can't be all that good. Uh, that's not true about the, this game I just mentioned because it has gone through numerous versions and it's been uh, play tested and feedback from players has been incorporated into the game. And when I read the third edition rule set, which I believe that's the edition it's on right now, I was really impressed with the quality, the, the quality of the writing, the quality of the editing. Um, it, it is uh, it is definitely well done. And uh, But anyway, let's... Let me jump real quick. So maybe a year ago, maybe a little longer than that, I started hearing whispers and mention of a game called Old School Essentials. And, you know, when you're when you're on Kickstarter or when you're playing games, you hear a lot of games and you have to pick the ones. A lot of times you just you have to be picky. You know, what am I going to what am I going to um, play or invest in? Uh, this time, uh, that um, your money is limited, your time's limited. You you can't buy every game. You can. Some of us buy a lot of rule books, but we end up never ever playing them. So I discovered Old School Essentials, and and uh, you could download it at the time, and I think you still can. You could get a basic free set of the basic rules. It didn't have a lot of um, didn't have a lot of graphics in it. A lot of uh, it was just, I think it was mostly text, but it could get you the, it could get you the bare bones of the game so you could read it and decide, you know, if you, if you liked it. And I remember I downloaded it. I went and grabbed it and I read it and I was like, this is pretty cool. And again, I was having flashbacks to, you know, those early games of d and I played. And so I, you know, I read the rule books, but I, I just, nobody was, I did I wasn't aware of anybody playing the game in the Atlanta area. So it, it promptly just got filed away as cool. I like it, but you know, not gonna get to play it. But at some point, I stumbled upon, I was very lucky, somebody put me onto it, probably a friend here in Atlanta, put me onto the Kickstarter. They were running a Kickstarter, and they were re they were they had already come out with a basic version of the game, very simple version of the game. But then this Kickstarter was offering something called the advanced fantasy version, which um, was not going to be advanced Dungeons and Dragons. It was going to be more like the X in the BX, the expert set. And I, I, I pulled the trigger. I said, you know what? I want that just, just, just to have it on my shelf because I do like to have print copies of books. I ended up buying it, then I, or backing it, and then I promptly forgot about it. Well, the Kickstarter, you know, funded. Some time went on. And then in my mail, these two books arrived. <laughs> I got the referee tome and the player's tome, and they're called tomes. They're they're thick. The original game you can buy. You could. You can't do it anymore. You could originally buy the game in small books. Each book was maybe like I don't know, sixty pages, give or take. <clears throat> there was a book that had all the magic items and spells. There was a book that had all the monsters. There was a book that had all the classes. Um, things like that. It was broken up, um, and again, I don't play it. I'm not a player, so I, I don't remember all the details of the player book, but that's how it was broken up. The referee's guide, you, you know, if you wanted to be the GM, they call it the referee in Old School Essentials. If you wanted to be the GM, you bought the, you bought the monster book, the treasure book, probably the spell book, and you may even buy the player book because, you know, as a DM or a referee, you wanted to know, you know, the details of that. And it was sold in these like little four, I think it was four or six books. I didn't want to deal with that. So I bought the, the, the referee tome, which had everything in it for the, for the referee. Spells, uh, not, no, the, I'm sorry, the spells come in the player tome. The, the, the uh, referee tome comes with the creatures, the magic items, the basic rule set of how to play, um, a bunch of other stuff. And um, it's a it's a big, heavy, thick book. And I 
I apologize. I uh, when I take a break in on just a bit, I'll go grab my copies and then introduce you to them when I pick back up on this video. But they arrived in my mail, and don't you love when a Kickstarter that you sort of I, it's not that I forgot about it. I just when I back a Kickstarter, if I know that the the delivery date is sort of far out, I just put it out of my mind. It'll get here when it gets here. I don't get all now, there are some games I'm watching constantly, you know, but this one just wasn't one. And it wasn't because I didn't think it was going to be good. I just had plenty of other games going on, so I didn't have to focus on it. And honestly, at the time I backed it, I really was not anticipating playing it. I backed it uh, as a rule set to just keep as a reference to sort of have, um, you know, in my back pocket as something that I could I could read and enjoy and and uh, maybe take to the beach. I mean, I know some people read fiction books when they go to the beach. Guess what? I read I read rule books, gaming gaming books. Um, to, to my wife's utter surprise, she'd be like, "What are you reading?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm reading uh, such and such uh, rule set." She just shakes her head. But um, the books arrived, and I immediately. I mean, they were very high quality, as you'll see when I show them to you. Very high quality. And I was really just impressed with the layout. Um, as a writer, as someone who writes for a living, I can so appreciate when something is done well, especially when I'm talking about something that's printed or published. Uh, and these books were well, the, 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 um, the binding, the heaviness of them was just rock solid. The editing of the, uh, of the text the layout, it was just really all of it well done. Could not could not find anything to complain about uh, with that Kickstarter. But as I started reading more and more, I, I discovered a Facebook group that was of fans of the game. Then I found an online game that I got to play in as a player. I wanted to play it and see how see how well it held up to that original idea of the original D&D, &D. played an online game, absolutely just had a blast. And that's when I decided, now keep in mind, at this time we were in COVID and um, there is, there's no D&D &D gaming going on in Atlanta. Uh, the two game stores that I frequent had, had stopped all RPGs. I mean, nobody was, you know, allowed to sit down at a table and, and play these games, um, you know, as a group because uh, we were in a pandemic. So I, I was forced to go online. And um, even playing online, which I don't really enjoy, to tell you the truth, I don't like playing games online, although I'm getting better at it. I, I will say I, would, I wouldn't mind running some games online, especially some old school essentials. Maybe I'll look into that. If you're interested in that, let me know. I, I might, uh, might could be talked into doing a, an occasional online game. So... Long story short, I played it and I was just like, this is, this is awesome, but no one is playing Old School Essentials. No one's even playing 5e right now. But as I continue to go down that rabbit hole and really, really read and, and get into the, the game, something clicked in my mind and I said, you know what, if I'm going to return to playing a fantasy role-playing game at a table with players, this is what I want. I don't want to play 5e. And again, I'm not knocking 5e. I'm saying that 5e just didn't give me, as the DM, the enjoyment that I could see that uh, I would get from Old School Essentials. And that's probably going to disappoint some of my players who might not know about this, but I, I made a point. I asked my gaming store, I said, when you guys return to playing fantasy role-playing games, specifically D&D, &D, would it be okay if maybe I ran an old-school essentials game? And they tentatively agreed. They said, yeah, we'll see. Now, I don't know. I may not have anybody. Uh, I may not have anyone sign up. Uh, 5e is definitely um, definitely popular. I mean, I'm not not going to knock it. It's a it's a great game, and it's got a very large uh, fan base. But 
I don't want to play it. And I tell you what, I'll go ahead and tell you some of the reasons I don't want to play 5e anymore. And my my gaming friends and other friends who who play not just RPGs but board games, they've heard me elaborate on this quite a bit. I just I think 5e, and again, everything I'm saying here is my opinion. If you don't agree with it, that's fine. We there's so many games out there. We don't all have to agree on the same stuff every on every on every point. But with me, 5e has just gotten too crazy when it comes to the number of classes, the number of races, um, the, sh the just the, the the sheer rule set alone. As a DM. I, I made it quickly apparent to my players at my table that I was not going to be that DM that knew every rule by heart. I could not tell you. If somebody would say, I'm going to cast this spell, I would say, okay, tell me about that spell again. I, I don't have a great memory to begin with. Memorization has always been hard for me. But my, I sometimes got the idea that my players were kind of like disappointed or a little shocked that I would not necessarily understand every rule of 5e. Or sometimes I wouldn't implement every rule of 5e. I, I would make rules on the on the fly. Um, and I know some players don't like that. They want to know the rules are, are being, you know, uh, adhered to as they're written in the book. And I, I didn't always do that. I am a seat of the pants DM. I can... I can plan, but I also allow for a lot of randomness in a game. And that can bother some players. Now, the other thing about 5e that I didn't like was, and, and a lot of people have differed uh, with me on this opinion, but 5e, in my opinion, lacks the risk element. It is, it is very difficult for a player character to die in 5e. It is. It's very difficult. And I'm not the only person that agrees with this. Check out any of Professor Dungeon Master's uh, videos on some of the rule changes that he makes and things um, over at uh, Dungeon Craft YouTube channel. And you'll you'll see a lot of a lot of DMs, a lot of people that DM that enjoy that role they will they agree that 5e it's it's just it's not that we want to kill players i'm not saying it's it's very hard to kill a player a dm can kill a player very easily but you have to you have to go outside the rules of 5e the rules of 5e tend to want the dm or ask the dm to to create combat encounters that are balanced and that's that whole CR challenge rating system. If you've never looked in the in the monster manual or DM'd in 5e, uh, a, a, each creature has a CR rating. It's a number, and there there's like a <laughs> there's different methods you can use to balance. Like let's say you have a party of five, and they're all first level characters, level one, five level ones. There are rules or there are um, options to pick monsters and their quantities that will balance against five level ones or four level threes or two level eights, things like that. There are options that, you know, you can pick this creature at this CR rating and if it goes up against five level ones, this is an easy combat, no deaths, easy. And then there's, you know, somewhat hard, middle of the road, deadly, fatal across the board, total, total party kill. The DM can tweak the creature to make it more difficult or easy for a group of players. And you're like, well, there, that's cool. So yeah, you can do it. You can't, it's it, it is easy to kill a player character. Death can come easy. But the game is not really designed for the DM to constantly, constantly throw unbalanced creatures in terms of CR at the players. Because if you do that, they are going to die. And 5e is not, in my opinion, it's not about the adventure. It's, it's, it's gotten away from the dungeon delve, the going after treasure, the looking for mysteries down in a deep, dark tomb. 
5e is more story driven. It's it's more epic in in nature. The players are all, you know, none of them have low stat scores. I think the lowest you get is a 10 or a 9. And if you do the assigned uh, assigned scores, if you do the point system or the way the 5e player handbook um, describes, all your characters, honestly, a level 1 5e character could easily take on three or four level one old school essentials characters. That's my opinion. I'm making that up, but I, I think it's true. And it's because the stat scores are so out of whack. When a level one character enters the battlefield on their very first game, depending on their class they've chosen, they automatically are at a plus if they've maxed out their 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 uh, stat for their class, with their proficiency rating or proficiency bonus, excuse me, they are at plus five. So a fighter with strength eighteen has got the plus three stat bonus, and then a plus two proficiency. They're at plus five. Boom, just like that. And I, again, I may have my numbers wrong. I'm, I'm doing this from memory, but it's crazy. And what that means is. That player rolls a, tw a d20, the minimum they're going to roll is a 6, which is still a miss in most cases. But rolling a d20, on average, you're going to roll, if you roll it 100 times and get the average of all your rolls, it's going to be 10.5. If, if you don't know how I calculated that, just go look up statistics, basic statistics. It's going to be 10.5. The average of 100 rolls on a d20 is going to come out to 10.5. So... On average, a player is going to roll a 10.5 and add plus 5 with their stat and proficiency bonus. So they're not ever going to roll, well, not ever. They're on average always going to roll 15 or higher. And 15 or higher, quite honestly, for most CR1s and two creatures, is enough to beat their armor class. So, and again, I'm not looking to debate in the comments the, the mechanics of 5e versus anything like this. I'm telling you how I've experienced it. Maybe you've experienced it wrong. A lot of DMs uh, run their games differently, and so that may not apply across the board. But I'm telling you that I that's what I have experienced at my table running 5e. So um, let me stop right here. I need to take a break and rest my eyes. But here he is. I've got him pants, armor and body painted and the base. So I'm gonna take a stop right here real quick and I'll be right back. All right, I'm gonna take a break real quick and just while the paint dries, I'm gonna show you. This is the Old School Essentials Advanced Fantasy Referee Tome and this is the Player's Tome. As you can see, they're pretty beefy books, although they're small. They're not, uh, they're not large like the 5e books, but they are thick. And um, again, to play the game, this is all you need. Uh, well, if you want to be a referee, this is all you need. If you want to be a player, the other one's all you need. And um, you can still get them. Uh, right now, I believe the player's book, the player's tome is out of print, and they're reprinting it. Uh, obviously, there's more players than there are referees, so they tend to sell out of that one. You can, as of yesterday I checked, the, uh, the Advanced Fantasy uh, referee tome is still available on the necroticgnome.com website or its store, uh, you can still get it. Um, just as an aside, they are going to be running a new Kickstarter later this year. I think it's in November. I could be wrong. Maybe it's December. They're going to be running a new Kickstarter. They're going to be doing a boxed set. So if you want to get into Old School Essentials, maybe hold on for just a little bit longer and wait for that Kickstarter. And I will try on my Tabletop Engineer Facebook page when that thing goes live. Trust me, I will let all my friends know that it's up and running so that they don't miss out. All right, so um, I made a mistake, by the way. Uh, I stated that um, a fighter with 18 strength was having a plus five you know, to, um, to his, his attacks. It's plus six. Plus four for the 18 strength stat, and then plus two for the proficiency bonus. So plus six. So if you look at the average, on average, a fighter player is going to roll a 16 and a half, uh, depends on whether you're, uh, well, you know, 16 and a half, we'll just say 16. It's going to roll 16 on average. Uh, you know, they'll roll lower, they'll roll higher, but on average, uh, they're going to roll 16, which is more than enough 
to hit most creatures that I would say are like, you know, level or CR three or lower. I'm just pulling that out of my hat. But um, I, I, I just know as a DM of 5e, I can tell you that the players, the heroes, the adventurers that they make for the game come out of the box. I mean, they're, it's, in game one, they are super heroic compared to old school essentials. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because a lot of what 5e is about, as I stated earlier, is the story. It's an epic grand scale. You want heroes <laughs> who are grand in scale um, doing incredible things. The, the, the players, the player characters are supposed to be above normal, above average. But in an old school game, that's not the case. Old school D&D &D games are all about uh, you know, the, the, the little man, the, the beginner, the novice taking a big risk going down in the caves or the dungeon and bringing back treasures if they come back alive and they don't always come back alive. And I think a lot of players of original D and D or old school versions of D and D have very fond memories of that because when you're sitting at a table and your, your character <laughs> maybe their maximum stat is strength, and it may be at most, maybe it's 12, right? You're a fighter. You, compared to a, to a 5e character, you're, you're like a townsfolk. <laughs> you're, not, you're not supposed to be out there. But that's what old school was about. It wasn't about these epic heroes who are heroes from day one. It was about achieving those goals over time. Now, I will tell you that as a player and as a, as a DM in those old school games, part of the fun was that nervousness. You know, is my character going to make it out of this alive? We would frequently, I, when I played, we would frequently run away from monsters. When I was a DM, my players would frequently run. You, you see a, something that you don't know what it is, but it looks really, really nasty and hungry. You're... You, it might be sitting on a pile of gold coins, but you know what? Players would be like, no, I'll find, I'll find more gold elsewhere. And we would run. Or sometimes we'd get in a fight and we'd realize very quickly that we were in over our head, or my players would, and that's when they would run. And sometimes running is the best thing. Not, every not everybody makes it away from a successful run. Uh, sometimes the, the, the monster would gobble one up as, as you were running away. But... It was the it, there was this constant nervousness of you know what are we what's around the corner what's beyond that door you know I can't count the number of games I've run in 5e where the players would counter a door check for locks check for traps and then just open the door and just move on through to the next side you do that in an old school game you're you're not going to survive very long you have to role play and you have to tell the DM what you are thinking and what you're doing. Um, you don't have skills. Another thing with old school essentials that's different from 5e, which may surprise some of you and may turn away some of you, is you don't have these skills in, like you do in 5e. You're not an acrobat. You're not a swordsman. You're not a... You don't have a history, a background of... of uh, being a merchant, or I, I'm I'm pulling things out of the air because I can't recall half of them. But um, with 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 old school games, if you want to do something, you just tell the DM, "I want to do this," and it's up. And, and the DM will meet, you know, will will referee the rules as as they are to determine if you could do that. You didn't have to say, "Well, I'd like to pick that lock, but I don't have that skill, so I can't do it." Now, man, a wizard or a magic user, a fighter, anybody could try and pick a lock. You probably weren't going to be very successful at it unless you talked your way into it with the DM and convinced them that somehow, some way, you had a method of cracking that lock. It could have been as something as simple as I pick up the largest rock I can and I smack it against the lock. Now, in 5e, you know, you can do that, but most players are trained to make their actions 
based upon their skill set. So if they're not a rogue and they don't have that particular skill set of picking a lock or, you know, they're not going to even try it. And that was, that, that was a total surprise to me with 5e because Rarely would I find my players attempting to do something outside of their class abilities. They just wouldn't wouldn't do it. And maybe that appeals to you. Maybe you like those rule sets that sort of hem you in and they hem the other players in so that you you know what you can do and what you can't do, what you're allowed to do. But again, I'm just giving you reasons for why I have sort of turned back to these five to these uh, old school games because i i remember the the feeling of of you know danger i remember the you know wondering what's on that is it worth kicking down that door or knocking the door down or opening it what's on the other side are we going to find ourselves in over our heads are we going to die um and it happened oh i mean these days, if you kill a character, it's, and I've, I've been at tables where it's happened. I've actually occasionally had a player death at my table. It's, it's rare in a 5e game. But when, you, when it happens, it's so rare, it's almost shocking to the group. Like, what? So-and-so died at your table? Um, they, they can't believe it. Like, how did that happen? In old school games, I mean, it happened every week. You mean, players would roll up a new character and They'd find their way. You would frequently have uh, adventures with a mix of different level characters. I mean, it was not uncommon to have a couple level ones, a few level twos, and maybe a three and a four. And uh, it just, that was the way the game was played. And players didn't get upset when their character died. Now, the other thing that you didn't have a lot of in old school games was these epic backstories that, that 5e encourages. I mean... 5e has these things, they have backgrounds and they have motivations and those kind of things that players can choose, and it sort of fleshes out the character. But you would not, you wouldn't want to spend the time that it takes to create a level one character in 5e. You wouldn't want to do that with an old school game because you you probably had a 50, 60% chance of your first game. You, you may not make it out alive. So why develop this epic, epic backstory? for your character when, man, you don't even know if you're going to make it back. So a lot of times, characters would develop their backstory, their history, over time. Through role-playing in the dungeon, players would say, uh, you know, one player might discover he actually comes from nobility, or the players might discover one character comes from, from nobility, because during the role-playing, he might say, well, you know, uh, I, I this my so and so was raised in a in a in a in a castle, and I ran away at a young age. Well, you know, as long as it doesn't violate rules by the D, by the GM, uh, a lot of times the GM would allow that kind of role playing to build the characters over time, and that was fun. So by the time you had a level three, level four character, you know, you sort of had a little bit of. You knew about his personality or her personality, and you knew a little bit about their backstory if you were role-playing it right. But um, you, you don't have that typically with old-school games. You, you, you don't want to spend a lot of time fleshing out a character that is probably going to end up dead the next time it goes in a dungeon, or the first time it goes in a dungeon. So here he is so far. Apologies for the angle. Uh, I'm getting ready to do the bones and the, the claws, and then I'm going to get his eyes and do some, uh, do some uh, washes on him. I do have a red wash for his skin, and his, his skin is a little darker than I want, but trust me, I'm going to lighten it up a little bit. So for his claws, I want to go with this sky gray. Um, I, want them, I don't want them white, but I don't want them like yellowy black either. I want, to, I want a little bit of gray in there. So anyway, yeah, I, I have sort of taken to, uh, taken to this old school essentials thing. And as a matter of fact, um, one of the things I've been doing recently for old school essentials is I've been writing a magazine called Delver, which, um, which provides referees, GMs, DMs, whatever you want to call it, with um, content for the game, random tables, 
Each issue comes with an adventure. Um, it's not it's not that a player wouldn't enjoy reading the game because even if I were a player, I would I would read it. I, I just always like to read any kind of gaming content. I probably wouldn't read the adventures if my if I were a player and my GM asked me not to read it, I wouldn't because I don't want to ruin the surprises and stuff. But um, it's been fun. I've been I've been doing that. Issue number two is at Kickstarter right now, and it's it's doing well. And uh, I'm getting ready to, uh, in about nine days, it ends. And then I'll get it off to the printer. And, um, and then I'll get started on Delver number three. Delver number one did well, and it continues to grow. And that's what convinced me that there are players out there who are like me, who are looking for that old school uh, sense of, of gameplay. Um, now, one of the things you should know about Old School Essentials is it's just one of many BX clones. All right, You don't have to play it. But what's really interesting about Old School Essentials and all these BX clones is you can use all the content that has come before, all the TSR modules, the old D&D modules. They are all usable um, because the stats inside them are are created mostly well not everything some are created for advanced D&D but a lot of the adventures are ready to go because the BX games have not modified much if anything of the stats of creatures and the 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 different mechanics of the BX game are all there so you have this huge library of content that you can use um, read, right, just ready to go right out of the box. If you're not good at writing your own adventures or you just don't even want to, you don't have to. There's a, there's an entire drive through RPG is full of them. I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of games out there ready to go uh, with, with content so the DM does not have to create it. And that's that's a big that's a big deal to a lot of DMs because Creating adventures can take time. Now, I would often roll random uh, adventures at the table. Um, there was a there was a set of uh, charts and tables at the back of the advanced D and D uh, book that would allow you to roll up a dungeon on the fly. You would roll corridors and rooms and sizes and things like that. All you know, just rolling dice and then tell the players what what they see in front of them. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but uh, I would use it quite frequently. So I am very sold. I am, I am definitely a person who um, is sold on random encounters and, and things like that. And quite honestly, you don't see a lot of that in 5e. And I missed it. I, 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 I know a couple times I would roll up a random chart or a random magic item and my players would freak out. I remember one time I rolled on a random treasure and I rolled one of the most incredible uh, magic items for the players and they all sat up taller and, they're, and I you know I, I did it in front of them so I kind of felt like I was obligated to uh, to keep it uh, to allow them to use it and it was it was overkill I mean it was real real overkill and I kind of shouldn't have done that but then again I was rolling randomly and doing things like that for them and uh, they seemed to appreciate it but yeah, the whole random the whole random thing is is a very strong aspect of old school adventures is uh, random encounters, and a lot of random encounters you're not intended to fight. You're meant to examine them and determine if they're worth because most random monsters did not have um, they don't have magic items to uh, to take or or what have you, and so you have to balance. It's like, do we, do we fight these wandering creatures? Because you don't get XP, you don't get much XP for fighting a random creature. Uh, and you had to sort of decide if it was worth the risk. Now, that brings up one of the biggest changes for 5e players to accept when it comes to these old school games. This one's going to throw some of you for a loop. If you've never played an old school game and you don't know how characters level up, you still do XP. You gain experience points and you level up. Now with 5e, there are things called, um, uh, oh, I forget, I just went blank on the name, but they're, they're like um, 
thresholds. You know, you, you, if you get this far into the adventure, you automatically level up. Um, you don't, so it doesn't matter about XP. You just uh, you just meet a certain goal and you you automatically level up. But with old school essentials, you you do XP. And one of the primary ways. This is going to throw some of you that you guys get that you get as a player XP is through gold. Every gold coin that is collected or every if you get pieces of jewelry for example they have a net value of gold. At the end of the adventure or, the, or when they go back up when the adventurers head back up to to safety uh, you add up the value of all the gold that was collected in terms of coins and you divide it up and you don't just divide it up amongst the players. I'm going to mention something in just a minute called um, hirelings because hirelings get a cut of the gold. But for every gold coin that a player ends up recovering from the dungeon, that is equal to one XP point. So if you get 500 gold coins, let's say you have a party of five, just five players and you collect 2,500 gold coins worth of loot in that dungeon, when you come upstairs, you now get 500 XP each, plus whatever XP you get for killing creatures, which again, it's not a lot. Um, maybe 5 XP for a goblin or something like that. Um, you add it up, and that's how you level up. And people are like, what? Gold coins equals XP? But... Back then and today, it's justified. The justification is this. It's not the gold that gets you XP. It's the things you're doing in the dungeon. Mapping. Examining the walls for traps and secret doors. Fighting the monsters to get that gold. That is how, in the early days of Dungeons & Dragons, experience points, experience points were earned by players it was based on how much treasure you could pull out of the dungeon. And that is no longer the case. 5e does not do that. And quite honestly, there are times when I, I, I don't like that. But ultimately, I come back to, I, I do like that. I think that there is something to be said for, for gold as XP. And let me explain. When you go into a dungeon in 5e... Usually the players and the dungeon master are not tracking encumbrance. Why is that? Because encumbrance is annoying. Nobody likes to track how much weight their character is carrying into a dungeon. They just don't. It's a pain. You've got plenty to keep track of. But with old school games, management of your resources is a prime, prime feature of the game. Players are supposed to be keeping track of how many torches they have, how much food and water they bring in. Because in old school games, when you ran out of torches or water or food, you headed back to the surface quickly. As a matter of fact, you often did that before you ran out because you don't want to run out of torches when you're at the in the level level two of the dungeon and your torches go out. You need to get. You need to be heading up when you're getting very low on food and water and torches. But that's gone away with 5e. Now it's just DMs just assume that the players have enough torches. Um, everybody has dark vision. I mean, how many races? It's just ridiculous how many races have dark vision. And the game has gotten away from that management of resources to basically just. Let's, t let's, let's do something cool. Let's fight some big boss monsters and tell a really epic story. And that's all fine. A lot of players love that. And as a matter of fact, I would say most players love that. But there is nothing wrong with an epic story involving a group of players heading down into the dungeon and barely making it out alive with 500 gold coins in their pockets. That There are numerous stories that old school D&D players can tell you about close calls that are just as fun, maybe even more fun, than that epic fight against a beholder or what have you. Um, again, it's, it's all what the players want, but it's also what the DM wants. Because, like I said, as speaking from the DM side, I've sort of gotten over 5e. I don't enjoy some of the aspects of it because it's not nostalgic to me. It doesn't... 
I, I really enjoy those early games of D&D I've played, and so I want to play them again. And I want to play with players who want to to have that level of, um, of gameplay or that style of gameplay, not level. So, you know, it, it comes down to... It comes down to what do you want in a game? Some people are not going to want to are not going to want to track how much weight and armor and shields and gold coins and weapons they're carrying. And if that's the case, you're not going to do well with old school because that's a key part of an old school game. But it also, I, in my opinion, it helps with some of the realism of the game. You can't have characters walking into the dungeon loaded up with weaponry and food and water and torches and expect them to carry out just as much treasure and loot as they bring in. But that's what we see a lot in 5e games. It's an unrealistic conclusion to a game that the players come out of the dungeon having killed every monster, found every trap, every chest, recovered every bit of loot they can and still have food and torches and plenty of uh, hit points left. It's just, granted, I'm talking about a fantasy game, so saying something like it's not realistic is kind of silly when you talk about a fantasy role-playing game. But if we are talking about a fantasy setting, if you want to try to adhere to certain rules, uh, you gotta you got to have some limits on what the players are going to experience. You know, um, for example, uh, wizard uh, magic users in OSE, I think the maximum hit points they have is like, they can start out with is maybe five, maybe six. Uh, in 5e, frequently magic user or, or wizard or warlock players or, or sorcerer players will, will throw uh, a high, one of their high stats at constitution, so they get a constitution bonus. And... Then they can they can maybe they'll choose dragonkin as their as their race to get a, a bonus hit points and by the time you're done you have this level one uh, wizard dragonkin who is like super buff and is probably may have some of the highest hit points in the in the game but that's probably not true because your fighter players are getting you know a constitution bonus and they're getting race bonus and they're getting they're throw, they're probably throwing constitution at, at at you know everybody everybody buffs constitution these days because in five e it's really the only way to keep your your hit points high every level you get that you know it sort of snowballs I, I just um, I felt I felt it necessary to to talk about some of the limitations that I see in five e and and that's a funny word limitations because they're actually five e is stripped down. When you, do it, when you deal with old school D&D, it's stripped down. So there are limitations, but the limitations are because certain mechanics haven't been added into the old school game. They've, they've been added over time, so that by the time you hit 5e, or maybe even when 6e comes out, um, you're going to have so many mechanics for the game. Um, and it comes back to another thing, another complaint of mine as a, as a DM or GM is that I can't remember all the craziness that my players um, take to the bring to the table with their characters. I don't know all the feats by heart. I don't know all the backgrounds and how they affect um, how they affect things. It's really quite crazy what um, what Five E brings to a DM in order to remember. If you want to play the game by the rules, by the rules. There's so much you have to memorize. It's just, it, it's really difficult to be a, a DM. Um, and, and, and then, just to apologize to the DMs, because not every DM does this, there are DMs like Professor Dungeon Master who take 5e and then they strip out the stuff that they don't want. Like, for instance, uh, Professor Dungeon Master, he... I think he runs his games where the maximum HP that a character can ever have is 20. Whether you're a fighter, at least that's in one of the videos I saw of his. Uh, a fighter, a wizard, you know, it's it's like, okay, in 5e, you get up to a level 10 fighter. I mean, they're approaching 100 hit points or more, if not over 100. Um, that's crazy. I mean, combat 
goes on forever and ever and ever when you're dealing with creatures and characters that have hundreds of hit points or close to a hundred. Um, and then of course, you know, you get your action and your reaction and your bonus action. And it, it really starts to snowball the game to a, to a, to a crawl. And it forces DMs like Professor Dungeon Master to strip away things to make the games run quicker or at least run a little more, in their opinion, fun. We've all done it. All the DMs, including myself that I know, we all have 5e home rules that we bring to our table that make being a DM a little bit easier because it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to remember and it's a lot to, um, to have to keep track of. And again, I come back to, that's why I frequently tell my players, if you're going to cast that spell, tell me what it does, because I have no idea. I, I can't, I mean, I know certain spells because the players use them often and so on and constantly. And you get to where you just so know, know like, like a magic missile, you know, everybody knows magic missile. But there are some very vague spells that, that players will pick. And I'm just like, dude, I don't, I don't have any idea what that spell does. And then, and then it slows the game down because as a, as a DM, now I've got a new spell that I'm not familiar with, and I've heard the player describe it and, and, or maybe show me the, the, the card so that I can read it and, and understand exactly how it works. Now I have to take a moment as a DM and ponder, you know, how, is this, how does this work in my game? Is it going to slow the game down? Is it, is it, well, it does slow the game down because now I've had to examine something that I can't keep track of. Um, is it going to slow the game down further because is it going to require some additional roles on my part or the player's part? So my other players are sitting around waiting and waiting and, and, and for, for this to, uh, to resolve. Do that for every player. When every player has a feat or some special ability and now combat comes to a complete, <laughs> almost a complete stop, you don't get that in an OSC game. Or let me rephrase that. You don't get that in a in an OSC game that is run by the rules. Um, at least, typically, you don't. Uh, combat usually happens very quick. Initiative is often simpler. And again, I go back to profession du Professor Dungeon Master, who has his own ways of, of calculating initiative. And other DMs have... They use methods like group initiative, where the DM rolls one die and one player rolls one die, and whoever has the highest, either the players go first or the creatures go first. None of this separate initiative rolls for every type of creature. I'm trying to justify in my own mind. I've invested a lot of money in 5e. I've got, I've got all the basic rule books. I've got lots of adventures, and I've enjoyed playing it. So, so it wasn't money you know, spent unwisely. I, I enjoyed it. But I definitely am having to look at what I want out of gaming and ask myself, am I done with 5e? And I've already done this. Am I sort of walking away from 5e? And if so, can I accept that decision and not regret it? Well, after playing a few games of OSE online, and I've actually run one game with some test players, um, I have to say, I cannot see myself going back. I have had too much fun. I've had too many good memories. And playing the game and running the game has reminded me just how much I, I did enjoy playing D&D as a kid. Uh, the, the, the sense of uh, danger, the sense of wonder, it all comes back. And... That doesn't happen as an adult very often. You just don't get that opportunity to play a game that takes you back to your youth. Here we go. He's, he's really turning out good. Let's see if I can get him to focus. I'm not done with the eyes yet, but his skin is, as soon as that wash dries, I'm going to lighten his skin a little bit. So I guess before I end this video, what I want to try to tell you is if you're looking for something new, something new to try, and you want to play a fantasy role-playing game, and you sometimes feel like 5e runs too slow, or maybe it's just too crazy of 
too crazy of an adventure. It's, it's, it's so whacked, the story. Maybe you're wanting something a little simpler. You might want to look into playing an old school D&D game. And I'm not talking about old school essentials, although that's, what I, that's the game I'm using. There are plenty of old school games that you could look into playing. Uh, a lot of times you will find these games um, being offered at a convention. So you may have to you may have to wait a little while and attend a convention and try to find someone who's running um, you know, an, an old school game and sign up for it and play. And, and it might be after you play it, you just say, you know what, <laughs> this is not for me. And you know what, that's cool because at least you will have tried, especially some of the younger players who've never heard of old school D&D, &D. Don't, don't realize that D&D's been around a lot longer than 5e, um, maybe you want to try it and see how you react to it. Um, you might find a game that you enjoy playing a little more regularly. Um, I'm not saying get rid of 5e, I'm not saying stop playing 5e, but uh, definitely something worth considering. All right, let me bend this up here. All right, so here is Drax. Now, I don't want to make this video go too long, so what I'm going to do after the wash on his red skin dries is I'm going to use a dry, wash, a dry brushing of the same red or vermilion. I'm going to lighten it just with a tiny dot of white, and then I'm going to dry brush his, uh, his skin just to lighten it up just a little bit more. And I also need to do a dark wash on his armor and the gun. But uh, what I'll do is I'll do that, and then I will take some photos and append them to the end of this video for you so that you can see the final thing. And again, I haven't done the base yet. I'll, I'm waiting to get all my Stargrave Warband done, and then I'm going to do, build, do a consistent base uh, on, on all ten of them. So I haven't done that yet. So there you go. One Drax the Bounty Hunter, I believe is his name. Uh, I will put links in this video to the Die Hard website where you can go find that miniature and some of the other ones that uh, I've been painting. Um, Die Hard Miniatures does not pay. <laughs> They're not a sponsor of this channel or anything like that. I just I discovered their minis and ordered a whole bunch, and, and they're what I'm currently painting. All right, so here we go. Last up, Old School Essentials um, Referee Tone and the Player Tone right here. Uh, these are all you need to play this game. They do have a, they do have a, re a reference booklet, which is kind of like a little zine that you can get. It just has a lot of the major tables that the referee would use from the referee's tone. It pulls them out. Saving throws, combat tables, monster tables. Uh, Necrotic Gnome, which is the creator of the game, they also put out a semi-regularly zine of their own called Carcass Crawler. Uh, currently issue one is out. You can get it. I heard that, I just heard that issue two is in the works. Uh, it does not have a release date yet. They're not going to be doing it like monthly or bi-monthly. It just, the, uh, Gavin, the, the creator, just said he'll, he'll release them when they're ready. And I, I totally understand that logic. Um, Carcass Crawler and then, of course, you have a whole bunch of fans of the game, like me, who are now producing content for Old School Essentials. Um, you have zines, there are adventures, there are new classes, new monsters. Um, it's, it's, it's funny that it's sort of going back to the way it used to be when D&D first came out, because back then, uh, TSR was the only supplier of content through its modules. We call the the, the pre-written adventures were called modules back in the day, and Dragon Magazine. Now over time they they expanded it to Dungeon Magazine, and then you had third party uh, people coming out and offering their own adventures. But early on it was just TSR, and so people would create zines with additional content, and they would often just give them away, not sell them. Uh, and they were usually very low budget. They were photocopied on a, you know, a cheap photocopier and then stapled. And you'd, they'd be so full of spelling errors and hand-drawn imagery and pencil and stuff. It was just, 
It was a fun time to be playing a brand new type of game. Nowadays, people like me who are creating content for games they enjoy, we can do it and it has a much more polished look to it. We have access to printers that can do print on demand and they can print it and bind it and staple it and fold it and all that good stuff and ship it. And it's, a, it's just a really cool time to be a, a creator for game content because there are so many ways to get your stuff out there. It's a great time to be a player or a GM or referee because there's so much stuff to make the game more fun. And uh, as Old School Essentials grows in popularity, and it, and it is growing, they're selling out all their stuff constantly. As it continues to grow, and I think as the player base continues to build, I think we're going to see even more content uh, come out for, for it. So anyway, let me end it there. Thanks again for hanging out with me as I painted a mini and rambled on about old school essentials. Uh, keep in mind that these videos will be out one week in advance for my patrons. Uh, if you want to become a patron for just a dollar a month, I'll put a link in the description below. You'll get access to videos early, plus a lot of other free content that I don't make available. So anyway, thanks again. Appreciate your uh, time. Hope you liked uh, what I had to say about old school essentials. And I'll post some photos of this mini when it gets done. All right, everybody. This is Jim, the Tabletop Engineer. Everybody, take care.